Virtual studio visits are presented by Orange County Arts Council in partnership with Newburgh Free Library. The Arts Outreach Committee coordinates and implements these studio visits throughout Orange County, New York. These studio visits are made possible through donations from people like you. If you're interested in finding out about upcoming studio visits or learning on how you can support, please visit www.ocartscouncil.org. Molly McKinley is an interdisciplinary artist based in the Hudson Valley and New York City. Her work explores relationships between the body and nature, often through photographic tableau performances in remote landscapes. She also works with sculptural materials such as salt, glass, and earth, pursuing transmutations of time, erosion, and light through an intersectional feminist lens. She is a writer and incorporates poetic texts into her conceptual pieces. She studied photography at Bard College. She was a fellow in glass at Wheaton Arts in 2018 and mounted her first public sculpture commission, Dune Shift, in Newburgh in 2019. She is a former co-director of the School of Making Thinking. McKinley is an artist educator at Dia Beacon. Join us for an inside look of the studio of Molly McKinley. Sarah so brilliantly suggested that maybe I could bring some of my favorite books that I have in the studio out to show you guys. Um, so these basically like, these are mostly books about other artists, but I also have like fabulous Rebecca Solomit men explain things to me. <laughs> so this, this was like at the residency where I did this glass residency. The room that they gave me was empty of all objects, except maybe it was, maybe it was Karen Donnellan who's, who's in this group somewhere. Maybe it was Karen Donnellan that actually left this book. It was the only thing in the room. And it was like just emblematic of kind of like my reconciliation with like material bro culture. So this is a, a prized possession of mine. Um, and then we've got a great, this is like, I don't know if you guys know about eFlux. This is what my books look like. They have all these like obsessive tabs in them. And I like take notes as I read. <laughs> Um, but this is a really great compilation about care and intimacy by Eflux. But, you know, I've got Anna Mendieta, a book on Wabi Sabi, Joan Jonas, um, John McPhee. When I was down at Wheaton, um, that's actually in the Pine Barrens. And I read his classic text on the Pine Barrens. Um, it was, it's really, that's like a whole other long thing that's exciting to talk about. But maybe we'll get there. Anne Truitt, uh, John Dewey's artist experience. I'm a huge John Dewey fan of his philosophies. Um, green Hermeticism, uh, poetry, I love Rimbo, like a big sucker for Rimbo. This is John Eshberry's inter uh, Illuminations. Uh, and then I've got this great book, this Agnes Martin, this rare book that uh, my godmother gave me. Um, Sexual Personae, Camille Paglia, classic. Um, anyway, so those are a couple of my books. My big library is actually upstairs, but I like to keep just a, my little stack of whatever it is that I've, I'm working with at the time. Um, and also not to make this like too show and telly, but like, I do really want to show you guys, this is my camera, just so you like have an idea of like what I'm dealing with. <laughs> um, That's what you use? This is what I use. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is definitely like one of the earliest, if not like, I mean, it's not the earliest kind of camera that existed, but um, it's based on, you know, like this is what Ansel Adams was shooting on. He was shooting in a slightly larger format, eight by 10, but I also um, for a long time shot an eight by 10. This is four by five, which those um, measurements refer to the, the sheet of film. This is four inches by five inches. So all of these priestess photos are made with this like old school, um, pretty phenomenal camera that's actually contemporary. It was made in the 2000s. Um, and the reason for using something like this is because on a four by five inch piece of film, you can actually capture like really cinematic, gorgeous detail. 
um, in a way that you can't with like either a 35 millimeter camera and certainly not with any easily accessible digital camera. Um, How are we doing out there, guys? Oh, it has another question. Ooh, Catherine. Um, do you have any worries about what you do with your artwork that hasn't sold and what happens to it when you die? For example, as an artist, much of our hard work could end up in the dump, word, especially if we don't make it big like Jeff Koons, George O'Keefe, and those who are deemed collectible by museums, wealthy people. That's why I work with biodegradable materials, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Send it back to the earth where it came from. Fuck it. Like, who cares? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I will say when I when I was I was thinking about this recently, but when I was little, I found when I found out about death, the first thing I thought was I was like really into stamp collecting at the time, and I was like, "What is going to happen to my stamp collection?" And I was so disturbed and distraught about what was going to happen to my stamp collection, and I was like, "It's going to be buried with me. It just has to be buried with me. That's the only thing. I I, I can't think of any other thing." And I like spent so long thinking about like where in the coffin the stamps were gonna go. And like, I mean, I was just kind of like a goth child, but <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, uh, that is all to say that I've been thinking about what happens to my belongings post-mortem for a really long time. And I think that it's a conversation about death more than success or hard work. It's about letting go and realizing that who cares what happens to your work after you die on a certain level, you know, it's like, I used to think that it mattered so much. Like what happens to my work after I die? Like I have to do this great thing in the world. And then like the more I became accepting of death and the fact that like the, you know, even the most famous artists like Georgia O'Keeffe, Jeff Koons, like they're gonna be forgotten about, you know what I mean? Like maybe they'll be remembered for a couple hundred years, but like, the arc of geologic time is so long. And I think that's what was alluring to me about working with glass because glass also exists in a geologic time scale. And it's a real mortality check-in and it's a real ego check-in about my own desire to feel like, oh, I have a plan for what happens to all my stuff when I die. But like, yeah, you're totally right, Catherine. Like a lot of stuff, like most ordinary artists, like our work's gonna end up in someone's storage unit or like, you know, maybe the dump or, you know, and like, maybe it doesn't, maybe it wasn't ever meant to last forever. Maybe it's meant to facilitate a conversation right now. And it's actually like the synergy of that human interaction in this present time and space that matters. It's not about posterity. Um, but yeah, it's, that's an amazing question. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> As you go out and make your photos, and it sounds like some people may find you what you're doing weird, yeah. Um, do you feel any embarrassment? How do you deal with this and come from a place where you create what you want? Uh, let me put the milky egg down and then I'm gonna answer that. Um, yeah, it's super weird and embarrassing. Like, absolutely. Uh, there's also like instances where I've like performed like partially nude and like definitely kind of public places. Um, it, I'm trying to think if there's like actually an instance where I've been interrupted and it's been weird. Um, I just actually last fall was working with my friend Eva who is a photographer herself, but um, I coerced her to be my model. And we were working, um, and this isn't really priestess work, you know, it was like kind of tangentially priestess. It's kind of like a new thing that's emerging. Um, and we went down to Little Stony Point, which is a beach in Cold Spring on the Hudson River. And it's kind of a local's place and there's usually not a lot of people there. Uh, but there are these three guys there with jet skis and they were way down the beach from us. And we were definitely doing like weird performance work and I was just like the whole time I was like, oh, I like really hope they don't come up to us. Like I don't want to deal with this. Um, and uh, eventually one of them came over and I was like, okay. Cause it just, it's mostly annoying. Like I don't want to be interrupted when I'm in the flow. Like nobody wants to be interrupted when they're in a creative flow and they're working. And it mostly, it feels like less, like there is that sense of embarrassment, but mostly I'm like, please don't make me explain my camera to you right now, which is like, they all just like, anyone who would who would kind of come up to me usually is like, 
let's talk about this camera. Like, what's going on? Because it's it's a spectacle on top of a spectacle. Like, the camera's a spectacle. The performance thing that's happening is a spectacle. And people just want to be entertained and they want you to like step away from your work and attend to their curiosity. And if I'm in a good mood, maybe I'll attend to it. Generally I'm annoyed and I won't be right. <laughs> and I'll be kind of curt and like cut it off. Um, but yeah, like these guys on jet skis <laughs> were there and one of them came over and he was like, hey, I saw that you're like doing something. <laughs> Do you want to come and use our jet skis? And, I, and going back to the beauty thing you were talking about with Kelly, I was like, mm, ugh, no, like jet skis are ugly, like plastic ugly thing. That, that's not my aesthetic at all. Um, and then he went away and he's like, okay, cool. And I thought about it and I was like, actually that could be really weird and interesting. And like, maybe I should keep confronting my own idea of what is ugly or what my aesthetic preferences are. And um, I can show you the result actually, which is a nice reminder that like sometimes if we, challenge ourselves to like not feel awkward and uncomfortable like cool things can happen um but basically we did this whole shoot on their jet ski they gave me the option of three different jet skis they had a a blue one a red one and a green one and i chose the blue one and this is my friend eva with one of my glass sculptures sitting on a stranger's jet ski on the hudson river um, pouring water out of this vessel. Again, trying to bring these sculptures into a landscape and use them as performative vessels um, so that they're not stagnant, so they have a sense of dynamism. Um, but yeah, I've definitely been embarrassed <laughs> and, and feel really weird. And, uh, you know, sometimes it just takes time in a certain location. Like, if I'm there for like 30 minutes and no one has come by, I'm like, okay, I feel cool here. Like no one's gonna come to this strange nook in the desert. I do try to get pretty remote, partly because I don't wanna be interrupted. So unless there's something that's really looks iconic and visually powerful that is in proximity to people, I'm not really gonna be somewhere that there's a lot of um, spectators. Um, but yeah, there's always that sense of like, you can't really get that deep into wilderness in America. There's always kind of, there's people around all the time, like that sense of getting deep, far away from human contact. Even when you're somewhere like Joshua Tree, it feels very kind of otherworldly and remote. Like there's that sense that like, yeah, sometimes you like smell a whiff of a cigarette and you're like, where is that even coming from? Um, oh, thank you, Catherine. Um, what, did I answer all the rest of that question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I get embarrassed, whatever, it's okay. I try to deal with it and move on.